Governor Doug Ducey tells lawmakers to hold on tonight what he wants to see before anything else crosses his desk. Arizona voters are not the only ones looking for answers. Now the feds want to know what was behind those long lines to vote. Plus, Ted Cruz treats Donald Trump to a rare defeat. Waiting on lawmakers, looking for answers, and watching the GOP. It's all part of Politics Unplugged. And good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welchin. This is Politics Unplugged, and we start off tonight with a request from Governor Doug Ducey. He's telling lawmakers not to send him any more bills until he gets one thing, a budget. And joining us tonight to talk about that is State Representative Justin Olson, who is the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and Representative Ken Clark. I want to thank you both for being here. And let's start off with you since you are head of that Appropriations Committee. How far away are we on a budget from now? Well, I think we're getting close. You know, it's a, it's a negotiated process. There's a lot of work to do to get uh, support of 31, at least 31 members of the House of Representatives, 16 in the House, and the support of the governor. And we're, we're making progress, and we're likely going to get there very soon. Awesome. Now, the, the, the Democrat here, are you guys involved in this process at all? At all? Oh, oh, no. You know, it was very funny. When we started appropriations hearings this year, it was announced that there would be no public input in appropriations hearing. We protested. We got pro appropriations kind of town hall meetings around the state. Mr. Olson was very nice to put those together. People were lined up out the door saying, don't cut these vital services, support education. I don't see that in this budget so far. Awesome. Now, we've heard reports that there are, you know, some uh, uh, basic outlines and drafts of bills going around. Tell us, what are some of the themes that you're seeing right now? How big is this budget going to be? What are some of the highlights? Well, I think what's important is that we maintain a structurally balanced budget, and that's what is a priority for me. It's a priority for, for many involved in the, in the negotiation process. It's, in, it's imperative that we don't spend ourselves into a situation where we're finding ourselves in a, a mid-year deficit in just another few years. We've worked too hard to get to this point to, to actually be so close to a structural balance. We're projected to get there in the next fiscal year. So that's why we're making sure we address the priorities of the state, mm -hmm. but do it in a way that is fiscally responsible, doesn't create a new deficit. Yeah, now we've seen that the uh, revenue numbers and projections are, are, are up in yeah. Arizona. There's surplus pluses of cash out yeah. there, not only in the rainy day fund, but in the bank as well. You're expected to see a lot more money go into a lot more programs, right? Yeah, yeah. And look, can we just stop with this dance for a little bit? So every year there's a manufactured crisis put together by the Republican leadership that cuts taxes for special interests so that the next year we have less money for the things that the public wants, education, health care, infrastructure spending. So let's just go to what the Democrats have supported. We have supported about $250 million of what is a little extra cash this year. Not even all of it. We're still going to roll much of it over. We're going to support K through 12. We're going to try and get teacher retention. We're going to support universities. Something that this, what the budget I've seen so far doesn't do. But what, the manufactured crisis. Yeah. What's the manufactured crisis this year? The manufactured crisis. It's the same thing. Look, last year uh, the Republicans pushed through a tax cut on insurance premiums for businesses that aren't even located or not even uh, headquartered in Arizona, mm -hmm. over 10 years that's going to cost us $157 million. I know Mr. Olson likes to say it's $3 million in the first year, but it, it's expansive. That's less money that we're going to have for the infrastructure needs we have. Look, it's like we have a house, right? We're paying the mortgage, but the roof has fallen in. Over the last 15 years, just for school facilities board alone, mm -hmm. we're behind almost a billion dollars. So are you manufacturing crisis? Well, you know, I, I love that perspective because it certainly is a different one than, than the one that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a, a, an unprecedented budget crisis, a $3.6 billion deficit sure. on a $10 billion budget. It's taken us many years to climb out from under that, that deficit. I, I'm very excited that we've been able to finally get to that point where we do have on the horizon, a structural balance. Is it a manufactured uh, fiscal crisis that we had? Absolutely not. Ask anybody that lived through the, the Great Recession. Uh, no, no, no. Let's it go, certainly let's was go a, a, an actual Air budget deficit that, that, that occurred. And what we did in the state is we addressed the needs of our state to make sure that we could get jobs in Arizona, get Arizonans working again. Did that include tax cuts? It absolutely did. Forbes, for the last two years in a row, has ranked Arizona number one for projected job growth. That's a direct impact of the fiscally responsible pro-growth policies is, that we've enacted good, in the this state This is great cherry picking yeah. because I worked in business attraction as the energy office director for the state and I had business owners say to me, hey, your tax credits are fine, but our labor force won't move here because we know the education has problems here in the state of Arizona. It is a manufactured crisis. You talk about climbing out of that. Yes, we all know that that was a recession. That was a problem. We had to climb out of it. But you can't climb out of a hole while you're digging it deeper. And that's what we've been doing. So I want to talk a little bit, too, that there are talks now. There's a $30 million tax cut in this package. 
nobody seems to know what it is. It's kind of mysterious. Is this a tax cut in search of a tax to cut? Oh, not at all. You know, the governor ran on a very clear platform, and that was that he's going to cut taxes, and he's going to cut taxes every year that he's in the. But, but nobody in, knows in what. But nobody knows which tax he's going to cut right now. There are a lot of different proposals that have been on the table, mm -hmm. including bonus depreciation, full conformity with the federal government on on that tax, mm -hmm. as well as. You know, other cuts that will stimulate growth and, and increase the jobs and opportunities for Arizonans and so that we can increase employment, increase economic opportunities. And what are your member, what are the members uh, in the House, the Republicans, what do they want to see cut? What do they want to what, see? What are you for, seeing from, for, this, from, from this thirty million dollars? What, what, what are they saying? We need we need to cut this. You know, like like I said, it's it's a negotiated process. There's a lot of ideas that are that are on the table, but I think that it's critical that we recognize that do we address the the priorities of the state in Arizona? Absolutely, we're going to increase uh, funding for for education significantly with the special well, appropriation that we did last last special session, as well as with the ballot measure that we referred to the ballot. And we have world class educational opportunities. Okay, now we've got to talk Arizona. about this ballot. Okay, so you're cutting thirty million right now. Meanwhile, from Prop One Two Three, you're going to take a third of the value out of our shared trust fund. You're effectively going to be paying for that $30 million tax cut to special interest for money out of our state trust fund because you're shifting it over, and then we're going to miss the revenue that comes from the interest on that trust fund. That's not funding education. And by the way, we're still going to be 49th in, in education funding, and this particular budget doesn't address teacher recidivism, trying to keep these teachers from going to California where they're going to get paid a third more. The by bottom dropping line is over that, that funding th for education is going to be $300 million higher in the base support level as a result of the actions of the legislature over the last two years and a result but, of Proposition 123. Yeah. That is getting the priorities to but, where the priorities Representative need Clark, to be. Representative Clark brings up an interesting point because when you do run the numbers, it doesn't move the state the, the, the needle up in, in any way, significant way, when it comes to per pupil spending, when it comes to teacher pay out there. And a lot of this money has already been owed or back out as part of a deal anyway. Well, you know, is, I, there, is there going to be more money in this budget other than the Prop 123? There absolutely is. There's about an $84 million increase in, in for K-12 education that is outside of the, the requirement for for Proposition 123 because of, of the lawsuit. But 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 I think this 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 hyper sensitivity, this hyper focus on on one measure of, of inputs you know, it, it ignores the outputs, and that is that we've had great success in Arizona. The, the, the students are performing well on the national report card, the NAEP scores are actually, they, they used to be in about the, 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 the top of the bottom third. Now we are at the median. Our, our students are performing on par with their peers across the state. That's great news about our education system. 64 of kids at grade four are not reading at grade level. That is not a good outcome. It, and by the way, this budget that we've been seeing circulating is less per pupil funding than even last year. $84 million is, is great if it actually addressed the no, new number of kids. Now, I want to move on and get, hit another topic before we're, we've got about a minute left here. Now, let's talk about higher education. Last year, we saw that the uh, uh, universities took about a $100 million cut. Uh, Community colleges, at least in the two big counties in Pima and Maricopa County, lost almost all their, if not all their yeah. state uh, aid. What are we going to see there? Is there going to be more money going into universities, more money going to uh, junior colleges this year? You know, absolutely. Uh, education, both K-12 education, higher education is a priority of, of the legislature, of the governor, and will continue to be a priority of the le legislature and the governor. Now, did we make a, a 2% reduction in total spending last fiscal year? Yeah, we did make a, a reduction in, in spending across the board, uh, or, or in the total spending, it came down about 2%. We held K-12 education harmless and actually kept the same funding level. As a result, some of the other areas saw a greater reduction than the 2% average that, that, that occurred. But as a uh, result I'll, of that, we got to structural okay. Okay, so we're running out of time. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Hey, to say it holds harmless is a little misleading. The Democratic plan would have truly held harmless, and it was similar, summarily ignored at the very beginning. All right, Significant all right. increase for education in it's this not, budget. It's not on a per pupil basis. Right, guys, got, not. All right, guys, we got to take a break right now, but we have lots more still to come on Politics Unplugged. Up next, the fallout from continues from Arizona's presidential preference election. Now the Department of Justice wants some answers about why it took some people hours to vote. And Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton come up short on votes in Wisconsin. Is it just a blip on the screen for the front runners or a turning point in the race for the White House. Still ahead on Politics Unplugged. 
Dad's an addict, and Mom claims she's anorexic. The doctors gave you months to live. I'm not lying about it, if that's what you're getting at. I don't get it, things. If I think something, I'll tell you. All new Dr. Phil, Monday at 3 on 3TV. On the next Wheel of Fortune, she's been doing it for years. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Until tonight. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Where's Vanna? Find out. Monday night at 7 on 3TV. Nope. No. Ew. Ooh, tasty. With El Pollo Loco's new tostadas, you can indulge in fire-grilled chicken and fresh avocados. It's a meal you'll want to commit to. Try El Pollo Loco's new signature avocado tostadas. All my kids' friends love hanging out here. What's up, my peeps? Because I'm the cool mom. Heather knows why this is the cool house. Yeah, your internet's blazing. We can all be on at the same time. <laughs> That's not why. <laughs> Mrs. Curtis is nice, but the Wi-Fi is great. Hey, sorry, you know you were filming. Oh, twinsies. Stop copying me. <laughs> Get access to the fastest in-home Wi-Fi with Cox High Speed Internet from just $19.99 a month. What do you get for $5 at Papa Murphy's? Dough that's scratch made each morning, real mozzarella, fresh grated daily, and the satisfaction of a large home-baked pizza. That's what you get with every Papa Murphy's $5 phase. Honestly, the smell alone is worth $5. Home-bake a fresh Papa Murphy's faves. Choose a large pepperoni, sausage, or cheese. Just $5 every day. Order online at papamurphys.com. Love at 425 degrees. The delicate skin on your neck can show age. Or not. New Gold Bond Neck and Chest Cream helps improve texture and increase elasticity. 97% had visibly firmer skin. New Gold Bond Neck and Chest for visibly firmer skin. Medical malpractice, nursing home or birth injuries, doctor, hospital or surgical errors, medication and prescription errors, all medical injury cases, call me now, Attorney Adam Davis. Call Adam Davis, 404-21-1000. There are lots of places where you can get a lot of food. But at El Pollo Loco, our family meal has fire grilled chicken, sides, and our avocado mango salad. So you're not just getting a lot of food, you're getting a meal you can feel good about. New three-course family meal. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Well, the candidates may have moved on, but the controversy over Arizona's presidential preference election remains. And that is tonight's hot topic. We, of course, all saw those long lines in many polling places two weeks ago. We also saw a lot of angry voters show up at the Capitol demanding some answers. And that is something that the Department of Justice now wants as well. And joining us now is political activist Randy Parras to talk about the latest development and what happens next. Thank you very much. Now, we all know that Helen Purcell said the DOJ is looking at why they cut the number of polling places from 200 down to 60. Obviously, they're looking at why, what, what that was done. Do you think they're going to be looking at voter suppression? So you definitely have to look at that because some people think voter suppression means, oh, someone had this devious intent to keep people from voting. Voter suppression is about the outcomes. The people on this particular day, by the very entity that's supposed to allow people the opportunity to vote, put a series of decisions in motion that did not allow voters to vote. That, that suppressed the vote. And that, and that took place. I think what was most troubling for a lot of people is like when they heard some of the reason excuses, whether it's the money, whether they, had, they did some matrix of, of determination with the journalists, that's not their job. Their not job is not to be MSNBC and predict turnout. Their job is to say, look, these are the folks who are on the uh, vote by mail ballot, take them out. This is the universe of potential voters. It's our job for the integrity elections process to have a system so that every voter, if they decide to turn out, whether it's 1% turnout or 100% turnout, they have an opportunity to do that. Well, they said they were basing these numbers on prior election cycles. I mean, what do you say to when you hear that? I mean, they're, they're trying to act like this is some science. There's no science. This is politics. And their job is to ensure the integrity of the vote, not to get caught up in what happened in the past, not to, not to project, you know, what's going to, the, the likely turnout. Their job is to provide the opportunity for people who decide to vote who are not on the vote who are not vote by vote by mail to have that right and so when they so someone made a decision as Helen Purcell Karen Osborne and others as well said right 60 is a good idea because they did some other calculation they try to get in the business of predicting turnout that's not what you do when you're the head of the county recorders and then you don't talk about we're not supposed to put a price on it so the last comment I want to make so a lot of people paid a time tax in other words if they couldn't put in the time to vote 
they had to pay that to actually vote. And a lot of people couldn't do that. A lot of people couldn't even stop to get off the car because there was no parking. Mm -hmm. And they saw they didn't have over an hour to spend and waste, and they had to get home to take care of the kids and family. Sure, certainly. Now, a lot of people were also reporting problems switching their party registration. Do you mm -hmm. think this is something also the DOJ might be wanting to look at? And what have you been hearing about that? Yeah, absolutely. Especially in our state when you have a presidential election every four years, right? And this, people think it's just a primary. And you have another primary system every two years where people who are independent can show up, who make up the majority of the voters, right, as a block, are independents here. They walk in, they get a chance to choose independent, or Republican or Democrat ballot. And so without a serious education campaign to let people know, I didn't hear anything leading up to the election saying, if you're an independent voter, don't bother showing up. This election's not for you. That message wasn't driven home. And so they need to invest in that to let in, uh, independents know that or change the rules to say, you know what, we want to encourage, we're not, we don't go the opposite direction of voter suppression, but just voter participation. And no matter what your party or else, you can come out and declare your intent in that day. Now, I think a lot of our viewers also remember kind of those angry meetings, uh, that angry meeting in particular in the House that was looking at the election problem. You were there. Um, there was a lot of anger there, a lot of, a lot of shouting, a lot of mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. What has been the fallout? What has been the reception uh, that you've been hearing since that meeting? Yeah, I think the tone finally has changed from the leadership, whether it's Helen Purcell, the, the chair of that particular elections committee, or the secretary of state, where they, she went from you know blaming the voters for, for turnout to, to vote as the reason why, to laughing it off, to actually saying that she actually screwed up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're finally hearing that message. So it's great that voters did come out, and those who, who saw what experienced what happened, they're actually actually able to weigh in on the process. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be some reaction, hopefully, to get it right. The other frustration when people are in the room, when Helen Purcell was on the agenda to speak, she then brought in a lobbyist from the county who uh, was not even on the, on the payroll, wasn't elected, who actually knew more than she did. So that's another thing about, so when people asked her to resign, they didn't do it because they thought she was a bad person. They did it because they thought she was incompetent to do the job. All right, now, obviously, we've been talking about this election a lot over the past couple of weeks, and I want to play you a clip right now from our partners for First Strategic that we actually got a lot of uh, viewer feedback on, mm -hmm. where they're talking about independent voters and some of the reasons for that long lines here. I want you to take a listen to this right now and respond after. Over 80% of the people that were in that line that were voting were actually ineligible to vote based on the fact that they were either registered independents or weren't registered to vote at all. And so they were the ones who actually caused the, the line, in mm -hmm. fact, by being there. If you took those independents out of the equation, those 60 polling places would have fallen exactly into Helen Purcell's numbers that she originally factored in, which was 1,500 per election place. That's how many people actually turned out. In my view, there was a lot more smoke and a lot less fire to this problem. Now, we did know that from Helen Purcell that there were 24,000 provisional ballots that were voted. Nearly 20,000 of them were thrown out because they were not eligible to vote. I mean, that obviously contributed to these lines, but what do you say? So, uh, blame the voter, why don't you? Where was the process? No, easy it is when someone shows up to have someone out there. I mean, Walmart even has greeters. Other stores have greeters when people come. Excuse me, are you, are you a Democrat, a registered Democrat, independent? Oh, uh, are, are Democrat? oh you're not? Bye-bye. You're you can't vote. It's, it's an easy thing to do, but let people sit there for hours? It's almost a fraud. That you're actually, by letting them sit there without having education up there, without putting signs up there, without blaring out. You know, when you go through security at an airport, they tell you what you can and cannot break, break through. There's signs posted over there. Were people told, if you're an independent, go home? But, but should voters, and this is the last question, we're running right. out of time here, but should voters shoulder some of the blame for, for this? Should they have known that independents weren't allowed to vote in this election? Is there any, any blame on the voters here? Not really, because, again, people want to participate in an election. And so if you have these rules that haven't been articulated, you know, most people aren't going to get up who aren't registered to vote and just show up at a polling place. I don't even trust those. I don't know where they got those figures. Um, and so, so, again, you have people who are actually going the extra step. These aren't the folks that get their ballot by mail. These are the folks who are getting up and making a conscious intent to show up at a polling place so they can exercise their fundamental right to vote. And so that responsibility is incumbent on the county recorder to make sure those rules are, are communicated, education, money is invested in education so voters know. So no one who is an independent wakes up thinking, I have this right to vote on this particular type of election. Excellent. Thanks a lot for taking time to stop by and chat with us. But we're going to have to take a break, and we got lots more. Still ahead on Politics Unplugged, Bernie Sanders nipping at Hillary Clinton's heels. Can Mrs. Clinton shake off her challenger and a loss in Wisconsin? And we'll take a look. And Arizona lawmakers set some new rules for reporters just ahead. It's, is this about safety or revenge?
If you've been injured in an accident, remember, the insurance adjuster works for the insurance company, and they want to pay you as little as possible. So call Goldberg and Osborne immediately. We'll make sure you get all the money you're entitled to. I love my students. They amaze me every day. But Arizona schools need help. Programs are getting cut. Good teachers are leaving our state. My students pay the price. Teachers support Prop 123 because it puts $3.5 billion directly into the classroom. Without raising taxes. And gives parents and teachers a voice in how those funds are used. So we can focus on helping our students achieve more. Voting yes on Prop 123 is a big step in the right direction for Arizona schools. 35 years ago, Social Security Judge Stephen D. Slepian amassed a team of professionals to help protect the rights of the injured, sick, and disabled. Social Security is paid for from contributions from your paycheck. If you are under the age of 65 and cannot work, Social Security protects you from the hardships of medical disability. They provide a monthly check and medical coverage. You do not have to go it alone. The Slepian Law Firm. We won't charge a fee until the case is won. Call 266-3111. This video was submitted by a student through the Teens Drive Smart program. For more information on teen safety, visit teensdrivesmart.com. If you've been injured in an accident, call Goldberg and Osborne immediately because evidence must be preserved and witnesses need to be interviewed before they forget the details of the accident. Call Goldberg and Osborne, 1-800-THE-EAGLE. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. It is now time to talk it out with our partners from First Strategic. And with us today is Marcus Delartino and Barry Dill. Thanks a lot for joining us. And I want to start off with the budget. Marcus, you are the legislative uh, guru here. You're down there all the time. Um, nice. When are we going to see a budget and what's it going to look like? I think it's going to be, I think we're going to start budget talks next week. Um, I would expect a very late night on Friday night. That doesn't mean it'll be over, but it'll be a late night on Friday night. Um, and I think session will be ending that end of that next week. And what are you expecting to see? Any surprises in this budget? Or is it going to be pretty modest like uh, the governor's proposal? I think it's very, going to be very close. To, you know, Representative Olson is probably the, the Sherpa here to, to follow. Uh, who's guiding the House side of the... One of my favorite yeah. words, Sherpa. I love saying House side of the... <laughs> comes up a lot. I, love I do want to ask about this $30 million tax cut. It seems kind of weird. It's, it seems like a tax cut, like I was saying, in search of a tax cut, Marcus. Yeah, well... I, it's were... a campaign promise that the governor has got to keep, so it seems more like he needs to keep that more than it ne there needs to be a tax cut. Well, keep in mind, though, there could be 100, 101 things going on here. That We could mm -hmm. be looking at a scenario where there's a big company that wants to come to town, much like the Apple uh, sure. bill that we had, um, or it could be a targeted tax cut. We don't know until there's a few more details to flush out, but it may at the end of the day be something some everybody's very happy about. All right, and Barry, got to ask you too, uh, you know, your, your partners from First Strategic, uh, Steve Rowan, Marcus over here, last we talked about the elections, he thought it was uh, much about a communication problem for these long lines as anything else. Do you think this de Department of Justice investigation is warranted and needed? I, I do. I, I, I do, because we have to ensure that this never happened again. Mm -hmm. And the I, th I think one of the biggest the biggest problems is how did people who were registered as Democrat or Republican get bumped back into uh, independent you know independent status? Now, having said that, um, it is very and, it, and it's also a funding problem. Mm -hmm. it, the, the education pro you know situation was compounded by the fact that the states cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, and they don't value the presidential preference primary as much say, as they would do the special election in 123. On top of that, the parties themselves, neither party, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, don't really want 
uh, independent voters determining their outcome of the presidential preference primary. So if it's not going to change, that's not going to change if the state decides just to let the Republicans run a Republican presidential preference primary and the Democrats decide to let have a Democrat presidential primary. All right, now let's move on. I'm sorry, Marcus. <laughs> We're <laughs> let's talk a little talk about that the Wisconsin primary election last week where Ted Cruz won the state. Uh, Bernie Sanders took it for the Dems. Any surprises here? I, there's only one surprise I think coming out of this election. One is, um, is you know, if you look at the exit polling, the women there was not a huge gender cap between men and women between Cruz and Trump, um, and I find that sort of fascinating because of all the things that Trump has said, done, uh, or inferred on women. You would think that this gender gap would start showing up in his numbers, and it wasn't. I was not surprised by I was not surprised by by anything. I think it was, you know, the polling was pretty. Pretty, you know, close in the Democratic primary, uh, 84 percent Anglo voters. Uh, that's pretty much been Governor um, or Senator uh, Sanders' strength uh, thus far. Uh, it, it, it will surprise me if the attitude doesn't change toward Hillary going into the eastern. Uh, well, let's next, talk, let's next, little, next yeah. week and the week after let's, are going to be really key. Yeah, let's talk her, a little bit her. about that because we've talked a lot about that Republican primary. Obviously, it's, it was the biggest field. Um, there's a lot more controversy in that, uh, you know, led by Donald Trump and whatnot. But uh, you know, how come Hillary Clinton cannot shake Bernie Sanders on this? And you know, is there a possibility that Bernie can catch her? As I was saying, Dennis, I, I think it's because of the the agenda, or if you will, or the timing of. The, the primaries. We're going to see a whole different, could see a whole different set of outcomes coming up next week in New York. The following week, there's five Eastern uh, Maryland, Rhode Island, Delaware, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. Right now, where Hillary's leading in all in all five of them. All right. Now let's transition back and let's head back to the state capitol. More specifically, the state house where Speaker David Gowan. It appears to have put a ban on reporters. Marcus, did, did, did anybody know this was coming? Are you surprised by this move? Uh, I'm not surprised. I know he does not like you. Um, it, I'm just kidding, Dennis. He actually <laughs> does like you. Um, you, pl but, you plural. That's, yeah, a, that's yeah, a plural. Yeah, yeah. A number of other states have looked at some measures restricting access to the floor. Um, it's been couched as a safety measure. I think that that's probably a <laughs> misleading uh, yeah, I, measure considering <laughs> where you guys are now going to, which is well, the lawmaker, gallery, well, which yeah. is... Um, well, the I, lawmakers are the ones it, that are armed now. Right. I, uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> clearly they are uncomfortable with having press on the floor. Okay. Now, I got to ask you, why do some people think this is revenge? Because it looks exactly like revenge. This looks like, this is Trumpinian. I just made up a new word. It's Trumpinian <laughs> in its nature. Mm -hmm. And f from a political perspective, it's just a boneheaded move because the narrative about David Gowan moving forward, Inside the media, outside the media, it's all over social media today, and yesterday, and it will be carrying forward. It's number one is this is the guy that had the problem using state uh, money and a state car t to actually campaign on, and that subsequently led to reporters being barred from the House floor. That's what's going to move forward. Yeah, exactly. And we also learned last week that, uh, you know, the Attorney General's office, you know, speaking of misusing state resources, is investigating. David, uh, Speaker Gowan, for that misuse. They are, and in an odd twist of fate, he actually asked the AG to investigate him over the matter, which was sort of an odd thing to do, but apparently that's the source of the investigation. But really, at the end of the day, Dennis, this comes down to one particular reporter who's written some, some yeah. stories that were not flattering and has um, some insignificant things that happened in his past that would show up in a background. All right, that's all the time we have tonight, but be sure to check us out next week for more politics on Plus.